All right, Ben, welcome to the FitMind Podcast. Thanks for having me, man. I'm grateful to be here. Yeah, so uh, uh, before we get into your um, your mindset here and, and talking about the mind, you're, I think you're probably the first professional bodybuilder I've talked to, and I just think that's such a fascinating world. So I wanted to start off by firing maybe a tough question here, but what is something that either a misconception that people hold about body about bodybuilding and what it's like to be a pro bodybuilder or just um, something that's interesting that that people that most people don't know about that career sure man I think a lot of people have a stereotype when you say the word bodybuilder in general people have this assumption that comes to mind and you know, to be honest I've kind of been um, fighting against that I guess for lack of a better term since I was 17 years old very aware of people's judgment against me the second I walk in the room. And I always wanted to ensure that and not only was I able to be articulate, but I was able to help hold the conversation with anybody. And I think um, that's uh, you know, one thing I've always wanted to overcome about the stigma of being a bodybuilder, the dumb bodybuilder or the broke bodybuilder, right? It's very, very typical of people to make those assumptions. And uh, I think it's uh, unnecessary for young bodybuilders, people who are aspiring to build their body to uh, have to make those two things um, related, right? So whether or not your, your audience thinks that most bodybuilders are dumb, most young bodybuilders honestly just separate the necessity of building your body and the necessity of building your mind. And I think that when you learn to integrate those two, it may be the greatest opportunity, in fact, to build your mind because of all the neurochemical um, responses that are happening to this high intensity exercise, right? Um, so we know a lot about, you know, what happens during exercise with these myokines that are released and the neuroplasticity that exists. And you know, I really believe that bodybuilding may be the greatest opportunity to become a uh, heightened level individual or a you know, potentially spiritual or potentially aware or um, educated individual because of the state you're putting your brain in. You're putting your brain into this childlike state of neuroplastic uh, absorption of information. Right. And I, I think, I mean, you're, you're definitely atypical here in the way that you think about building the mind through building the body and, and vice versa. Um, and, and I want to get into, into your thoughts there, but why did you get out of professional bodybuilding to begin with? Um, I, I'd heard that you lost a hundred pounds of muscle intentionally, which I think is, uh, I have, I haven't lost a hundred pounds. I set out to lose a hundred pounds in the beginning because okay. I, because I wanted to, I'll tell you the story why I left professional bodybuilding. Um, so like many people who uh, aspire to build a lot of muscle or aspire to do anything at an extreme level, um, I needed it, right? As a young uh, teenager, as a man, a young man in my 20s, I needed professional bodybuilding to overcome my fears and insecurities and, um, you know, all, all everything that I was trying to compensate for. And a lot of men go through that. And I, for better or worse, believe that um, building this huge body would give me confidence and character and, you know, take away my anxiety and fear. And in reality, didn't do any of those things. Um, you know, it certainly made me stronger. It visually gave me a great look. It maybe got me some different opportunities. But the only I realized that in order for me to change those characteristics that I didn't like, I actually had to work on those characteristics that I didn't like. It wasn't just about like, hey, if I can bench press 500 pounds, all of a sudden I'm going to have more self-confidence. Or if I get on the Olympia stage, maybe I'll have less stress or anxiety. It doesn't work like that. So when I finally made the realization that I kind of ascended the first mountain of life and I, of my life and I had accomplished everything I wanted to accomplish in this sport and it didn't do all those things that I originally thought it was going to do. Well, now I had to start taking inventory and going, well, why am I continuing to do this? And, you know, to be the best in the world at anything, which was my goal, right? I, I wanted to be the best in the world and I was very close at times. Um, you have to be all in or nothing, right? There's no like, Oh, I'm not sure. Like, uh, it's like, no, it just didn't work, man. You're either, myopically focused on hitting the top of the mountain or you don't. And uh, I had a lot of reasons why I decided to leave right from a lot of my friends in the sport dying from my uh, no longer having a purpose to do it anymore. It didn't, uh, didn't fulfill me. It didn't take away my fears and anxieties like I thought it would. And perhaps the biggest reason was the fact that I had two children in a span of 18 months and uh, I couldn't be the same selfish, ruthless person that I always was. And when I say ruthless, it doesn't necessarily mean characteristically, but it means in the gym. I needed to be that, you know, kind of voracious, uh, ruthless machine in the gym. And I just had a hard time accessing that 
you know, for two to four hours a day and then going home and being the kind, loving, giving dad that I wanted to be to my children. Uh, so I just decided I didn't need it anymore in my life. Right. That, that's beautiful. So you go from this kind of egocentric industry to being like a family man with values and caring about other people. Um, could you point to anything specific that led you to that new shift in, in kind of value system or did it come, come about over time? Was it just a realization? No, it was, it was honestly, it was an instant feeling and I'll explain to you, man. So throughout my childhood, from the time I was seven years old, it's kind of my earliest childhood memory. I was very much the lone wolf. I was always much, I was always very much, um, doing everything myself. I had this mentality of like two middle fingers to the world. I'm going to do it myself. And from the time I was seven, I would, you know, travel. I would, you know, take the subways and, and, and the buses to remote places in the city. And literally I was a little kid. And, and I just became this very independent person and built this armor around me. Like, I don't need anything. I don't need anyone. I can do it myself. Uh, the story I tell myself and whether or not this is true, I don't know looking back on it because perception is, is important. But, um, I didn't think I had love. I didn't know what it was to be loved, or at least I closed myself off to love. My parents weren't very close to me. They're either working or doing whatever they were doing. So I'd never really experienced the feeling of acceptance or love from anything outside of me. I just kind of created this armor to where I just protect myself and uh, didn't express, express a lot of emotion. I don't think I was unhappy. I wasn't angry, but I was always very closed off to attachment and relationship. Never had any. So the second my child was born, I experienced love for the first time. And that changed me, man. It opened my heart. And my son was the first one to open my heart and make me start to question what I was doing. And like, what was this? Like, why do I feel this way about this other human being? I've never felt this before. And then 18 months later, my daughter was born. And at that moment, it was like, okay. You know, my son was kind of the, the nudge, the foot in the door. My daughter just blew it, blew it all open for me, man. And I just realized, like, you know, I have these amazing uh, little humans in front of me and, and I want to connect with them and bond with them like I didn't get the opportunity to experience. So that's really where it shifted for me then was this, um, you know, just children opening up your heart to um, the reality of, of the world and the fact that love exists in all of us and, and we are here to give it, receive it, and uh, hopefully help other people find their own. That's wonderful, man. And and it's so great to hear hear this from you know, someone who's, who's clearly a, you know, a, a tough kind of testosterone driven male where, you know, you just, a lot of this, a lot of the, this, uh, this concept of love and how important it is, is usually something you hear from, um, a very different kind of uh, <laughs> archetype. Yeah. And, and so you're actually, you're kind of known as, as the bodybuilding yogi. What is, what does that, what does that mean? I mean, how do you, how do you integrate uh, meditation and yoga in your practice? How has that helped you and your clients? So, I tell this story often, but when I, when I retired from bodybuilding, uh, you know, as you can imagine I was walking around at anywhere between 300 and 320 pounds. My competitive weight was like 280, 285, like shredded. So three, 300, 320 was not even that heavy for me. And uh, my mobility was pretty good for most bodybuilders, but compared to, you know, like a yogi, for example, I was terrible. So my, my mentality in my life is if there's something in my life that I know I'm bad at, I actually want to dive in and I want to see like, Hey, let's, let's get better at this. So, you know, prime example, I wasn't very studious as a child. So now my kind of pursuit is like, now I'm going to make up for that. I wasn't a very good speaker. You know, I had a speech impediment. So now my, or what I, what I thought or what I was told is a speech impediment. So now my, you know, most of my revenue is coming from me doing public speaking. So now I find this thing yoga that I'm really bad at. And I just, I experienced it one time and I loved, absolutely loved the, the, uh, idea of centering my thoughts and centering my mind in connection with my body. And that's what I experienced the first time. Cause I'd experienced it in training uh, in the gym, but I also hadn't experienced at that level where I integrated body, mind, and breath. And as soon as I experienced that, I was absolutely hooked with what it represented to me. So that's ultimately what yoga represents to me, right? It doesn't, I'm not someone who's voracious in studying the culture of yoga what I'm studying is this integration of mind, body, and breath. So um, this centeredness that exists between feeling one with your body and, and integrating your mind and your breath is perhaps the most incredible experience that I've been fortunate enough to experience in my life is you know, to be able to walk around and feel 
again, for someone who has an, an experience, it's hard to explain, but just this centeredness, this grounded, this grounded feeling that just makes you feel like you are completely uh, at, at rest or at bliss, yet still conscious, yet still focused, yet still very, very on point with your brain um, because you spent a little bit of time integrating body, mind, and breath. And so that's what yoga is for me. And the practice now is you know, every other day I kind of integrate weight training and, and uh, yoga every other day, uh, alternating days, um, and really with the intention of not because I want to be uh, super mobile even, like even though I do aspire to be very, very mobile, just because I think there's, a, there's something that lies on the other side of this scattered consciousness that we all live in, right? If you can center yourself and, and become present in your own thoughts and in your own consciousness, there's something that lies on the other side of that, maybe, that um, I'm curious to explore. Yeah, well, it's refreshing to hear uh, the way that you, you come at this because I think – a lot of people for them, yoga is this just kind of trendy thing that they can post about on Instagram. And for you, it's all about what it traditionally has been about, which is connecting mind and body um, through the breath and through movement. Yeah. Um, I think most people take a, take a weird or a backward perspective, like going in there trying to achieve a certain posture. The posture is not the goal, right? The posture is an indication of your ability to let go of your tension, of your muscles, of your emotions, right? That's, so if I can't get into a posture, it's often suggested to be an indication of my tension that exists in my nervous system as a result of some pent-up emotion, right? So being able to get into those positions is not the goal. It's the result, right? It's not, I don't need to get into this position by whatever means necessary. I'll get into that position when I'm able to mentally let go of the emotional stuff that's lifting, living somewhere in my nervous system. And that's the disconnect is people have this goal of like, Hey, I have to get in that position, no matter how sloppy, no matter how floppy, like they just kind of melt into these positions and it's completely passive. And when I do yoga, it's very active. It's very conscious. It's contracting into positions rather than relaxing into positions. So it's not a, it's never a flaccid passive thing. It's always a very active, uh, relaxed, but active, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. And, and if you study the, the history of yoga, it was always um, about, you know, the asanas or the postures were actually about being able to sit longer in meditation. So it was a form of, a form of meditation and not yeah. what it's become often in the West where someone chugs a, a vente latte and then they come into their <laughs> yoga class already for a workout, um, right. uh, which, which might be, you know, that might be something they enjoy, but not really, not really what it's all about um, traditionally. And so do you have a separate meditation practice or is that, is that your meditations? Uh, I, do, I do, man. I meditate as often as I can, sometimes, mo often multiple times a day. And, you know, sometimes it's just five or 10 minutes at a time, but uh, just often, um, you know, the beginning of the day is just going to be a mindfulness practice. I find so much benefit from, you know, 20 minutes of presence and, and focusing on my breath and then you know, just allowing my brain to focus on one thing. Uh, and then throughout the day, I'll do things like creating my mind. So, you know, I have like this, this meditation. I don't know if anyone's ever done it or, or done it before me and created, put a name on it. But my thought is, you know, I believe that I can create a feeling in my body with my mind, right? So if I said, you know, I want to create the feeling of fear to you and you could think of a situation where you were afraid and you could ultimately, eventually, maybe not immediately, but eventually recreate that feeling of fear in your body. If I said, I want you to recreate gratitude, eventually you could recreate that feeling in your body. If I said, I wanted you to recreate fulfillment or joy or happiness or achievement or whatever it is, eventually you could recreate that feeling in your body. Uh, it may not happen the first day, but eventually you could do it. So my meditations are often focused on just creating emotional states uh, in my mind and then bringing it into my body before I start my day or if I'm going into a work meeting or if I'm going into a workout, practicing uh, creating emotional anchors, right? So getting into these states to, that uh, allow me to, to optimize the scenario. So if I want to go into a uh, scenario with my daughter who is now six, I want to be a very different person than if I'm going into a workout or a business meeting or anything, a meditation session. So, um, you know, learning how to anchor those emotions and kind of bring them up at will, I think is a really powerful thing because now I, I'm bringing myself to the world rather than um, create, letting the world create me, right? So I'm creating myself in my mind first and taking that to the world rather than going into a situation and the mind create, the world creating it for me. Yeah, and I got to tell you, that's such a superpower to be able to activate an emotion on command like that. 
and it is a trainable skill. I mean, if someone's listening to this and thinking there's no way I could just all of a sudden drop into a, a grateful mindset or, um, you know, a compassionate mindset or, no question. um, you know, whatever it is, just as I'm sure that you pump yourself up before a workout, you can activate these other, um, these other mindsets on command too. The, the one yeah. that I, that I love, uh, traditionally it's called, um, meta meditation. I call it emotional, sure. emotional priming yeah. is one, but you can really do that with, with any emotion, um, where you're, you're focused on cultivating that mindset just by calling it to mind. Mm -hmm. Um, and that actually starts to rewire the brain. So you start to think that way more often. So for anyone listening who has a hard time doing that, it's, it's sometimes important to anchor, uh, the uh, environment or the smells, right? The scents. So if you have a hard time remembering an emotion, sometimes if you smell a certain scent, it will bring an emotion back. Or if you are in a particular place, it'll bring an emotion back. Like, you know, where you maybe grew up would feel different than where you, you know, played as a, as a, you know, in college or something, right? All those things will anchor different emotional states or certain smells. Maybe it's someone's cologne or someone's perfume or some type of baked goods. Like all those things will, just so people listening can kind of start to understand, oh yeah, that does happen. Like I, I see those things or I smell those things and that does happen. But yeah, you can do all that in your mind without having to have those uh, environmental triggers. Yeah, for sure. So um, let's see, how else do you think about, hold on one sec, I'm gonna edit this out, but there's just a little background noise. Um, let's see, so, so how else do you think about optimizing your mind? Um, and I, that's a big topic. So I guess I'll start with how do, how do you think about, um, how do you think about your mind in turn, in terms of your training? So I've, you've talked about this mind muscle connection. Sure. So what is the mind muscle connection? I don't know if I ever use that term mind muscle connection because that's very, it's a very common term that people use in bodybuilding. And I think it's just misunderstood. So I try not even to go there because people's belief about what that means already exists. They have that preconceived belief. Uh, but for me, it's, it's learning to, um, go internal, right? So most people, when they exercise, it's a very external focus. They're focused on lifting weight. They're focused on exercises, whether it be the name of the exercise or certain, finishing a certain number of reps or sets or whatever it is. So what I want to teach is an internal focus. So I want you to think about what's happening inside of your body. So I want you to think about challenging muscles and I want you to think about tension within muscles. So ultimately it is, you know, a mind muscle connection, but I try not to use that term. Um, so I want you to think about what this muscle does and, is there tension on this muscle that I'm training in every inch and every rep? And what is the rest of my body doing? Am I, am I very stable? Am I moving? Am I cheating? Am I, what is, what is happening? So just get, taking the opportunity to kind of be present in the moment uh, with anything you're doing, right? It is, I think exercise is such a beautiful opportunity because, you know, when you're fresh at the beginning of a workout, it's a little bit easier and you can kind of, you know, work your way, your way into it and really start to pay attention and really be stable but now as you fatigue, you're mentally becoming fatigued, your body's becoming fatigued. Now it's a little bit more challenging. Now I have to focus a little harder. Oh, now I just lost my focus. Okay, I'm going to bring it back. It's almost like this meditative experience where, you know, you're always trying to come back to the single point of focus. And that could be something as simple as doing bicep curls or leg curls or squats or whatever it is, right? It's, it's trying to have the single pointed focus. And if we can do that, your training will increase exponentially. Your results will increase exponentially. I find that your body recovers exponentially greater. Um, you tend to get better mobility results. Like my ability to shift my, my mobility is pretty rapid because I'm so connected with you know, how my body feels, where there's tension, how to make that tension go away, how to make my brain relax that tension, my nervous system relax that tension, or conversely create it, right? If I need to create a, a huge amount of tension because I'm trying to move a huge amount of load, I want to be able to access that ability to create massive amounts of tension. And then as soon as it's done, I want it gone completely. I don't want it to have like half tension existing there. So I want to then relax. And I think that's just this autonomic nervous system uh, factors. Like, can I get my nervous system hyper aroused and then relax kind of uh, at will? Yeah. And there's definitely something going on there where, you know, the, the, the muscular, skeletal system is lifting the weight, but also the nervous system is doing something. And I remember listening, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger said one conscious rep is equivalent to many, many unconscious reps. Um, there was a study that confirmed this. It was done by the Ohio musculoskeletal and neurological Institute. Mm -hmm. It's a mouthful, but they did a study. Uh, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this one, but they, they put a control group They had a control group without a cast and then a, a group with casts on, um, for a few weeks and 
half of the group with cast did a visualization exercise where they pretended to, um, you know, that they imagined that they were contracting their wrist in a certain way that the, that the cast didn't allow them to. And then the other group just did nothing. And, and the control group, or I mean, sorry, the group that was visualizing only did this for um, about 13 minutes a day for five days a week for, for a couple of weeks. And they found that when they took the casts off, um, both groups that had, had casts on lost a significant amount of, of strength. But the group that had done the visualization exercises only lost 25% of their strength, whereas the group that didn't visualize lost 50%. So just that mentally rehearsing the exercise without even moving the muscle had, 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 um, decre had basically doubled their, um, had cut their losses in half. Right. And, and so something's going on there. Do we know what that mechanism could be? Uh, again, I, I can only speculate, right? It's something at the quantum level that, that we can't see, right? And as humans, we're, we tend to stay within the realm of our five senses and until someone can quantify it, you know, for me to speculate what it is would just be just that, right? It would be speculation. I don't know. Right, right. So, so interesting though. And, and I love the way that you're thinking about training, training the body um, through the mind as well. Cause I think this is, um, you know, something that, that more people should be paying attention to um, athletes and, and, and bodybuilders alike. Um, what else, um, how else are you training your mind? What else um, are you thinking about when you're trying to really optimize your, your mental state? Um, so I think the biggest thing that lacks in society is just the ability to have single pointed focus. And, you know, I'll do it as often as I can throughout the day. And it's really having um, a really, um, disciplined attention to whatever you're focusing on. And it could literally be for 30 or 60 seconds, right? And I think having an objective, like I, I really want to focus on this thing right now and making everything else less important. We all have, you know, FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. We're like, oh, my phone or oh, my, my computer or whatever. And, and making the conscious decision that this thing that I'm doing right now is the most important thing in the world to me in this very second is a big part of developing the shift in your brain, the neurological shift in your mind. So when I make that conscious decision, um, I want to be aware of all the things that I'm choosing not to do and be conscious of like, I consciously made this decision to just focus on this thing and now I'm gonna focus on this thing. So getting rid of all those things that I'm potentially fearing uh, of missing out. And then you know, just creating the single-minded focus. As long as I set the intention to do it, if it's, you know, even if it's one minute, that's a huge win for most people because most people can't count backwards from 10 without losing their focus. You know, if we can get to one minute and two minutes and 10 minutes, eventually it's an hour, eventually it's multiple hours. And that to me is a superpower in life. If I can focus on anything for anything longer than 10 minutes, you win life, right? Whether you're trying to win business or uh, whether you're trying to read or learn or whether you're trying to be in a relationship with someone or whether you're trying to exercise, the ability to, to focus for anywhere between one minute and five minutes is literally a superpower in this current day and age because most people can't do it. And if you can, you win, right? If I want to study something or read an article or listen to a podcast and, and you know, really truly take in someone's information, I have to consciously not do a whole lot of things, especially in most people's environments, very cluttered, lots of things that your brain could want to pick up and do. And to not to consciously say, no, I see all these things around me. I'm not going to do any of them. I'm going to consciously choose to focus on this one thing and nothing else matters right now. Um, there's, there's a lot of research behind how that will shift your brain a lot faster. Yeah. And someone might be listening to this and thinking, well, one to five minutes, that's, that's nothing I can focus for one to five minutes, no, but, but it's actually, it's actually follow, follow 10 breaths in a row in meditation. And you'll realize how, and this is, I think it takes a little introspection to even realize how much our mind's jumping around without us initially recognizing it. But one to five minutes is a heroic task. If mm -hmm. you can focus on one, one thing for that amount of time. Um, in meditation, you're starting to approach, you know, access concentration, these kind of jhanic or very pleasurable states, if you can actually do that. So that actually takes a, a lot of training. Uh, but I think it's, it's such an important point that, you know, focus, this is the movie camera that determines our entire experience of life. And it's not just about where the camera's pointed, 
but also the quality of the camera and the stability of the camera. Um, that's yeah, and all the, all the background noise that everyone else is picking or that your brain is picking up that you don't even notice, right? Your unconscious right. mind is always picking up things you're just not even aware of there. And learning how to become aware of those things and then say like, hey, I choose not to acknowledge you right now or I choose not to, to look at you right now. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And I think that's one of the, the biggest benefits of meditation that's not often talked about is that you're making more of your un- unconscious data conscious. Mm-hmm. So I read, a, I read a statistic, which is, is probably not accurate, but it, it's probably the gist is correct, where our, our unconscious mind receives or our subconscious mind receives 11 million bits in computer terms of data per second. And yet we're only able to consciously process about 50 bits. So we're unaware of almost 11 million bits of information that's influencing how we, you know, our emotions, our thoughts. And, and we don't realize that we're getting programmed by all that, all that, all that data coming in from our environment, from sound bites we're picking up. Um, it's coding our brains one bit at a time. So being, you're right, being able to both be conscious of what is coming at you so you can filter the stuff that you don't want to affect you, but then also focus that, that camera and that lens is, is so key. Yeah, so an eyes open meditation comes to mind, right, Liam? So, you know, many people say, oh, I can't even meditate, but I eventually learned to meditate with your eyes open. So you see everything, but acknowledge nothing, right? So that's, there's a lot of beauty in that, this, this very peripheral, wide lens view while I'm meditating. I'm able to see absolutely everything, but I'm only acknowledging maybe, sh- maybe shadows and colors, but not actually acknowledging what the substance is. And uh, just being present in seeing everything and nothing at the same time sounds kind of esoteric, but um, is, again, an amazing thing where you can walk through the busiest, um, you know, athletic event or sporting event or or shopping mall or whatever and be absolutely at at peace with all the chaos going around you because you could be centered in this moment. Right. Yeah. And I think that points to an important misconception about meditation too, where a lot of folks think that meditation is just about quieting the mind and being in this really calm, uh, perfectly placid state. Um, whereas you can actually be in a busy environment and still meditate. You could be on a subway and still meditate. And in fact, you can meditate with your eyes open. Um, and it is, you know, this is often called open awareness practice, kind of the, 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 uh, the name for this type of meditation where you're letting in everything and, and you're, you're basically recognizing things rapidly as just arising and passing away um, to put it in kind of the, the traditional Buddhist terms where things are, are quickly happening and then an instant later they're gone. And it's just mm-hmm. the next, the next bits of data are coming in and eventually all that leads to some pretty profound insights about kind of the nature of reality and the nature of mind. And you know, for me, what really matters and what really doesn't, right? What is my brain choosing to focus on? Why is my brain not choosing to focus on the other things? And, you know, actually be able to curate that. Like, I think this is important. I want to focus on that. I don't want to focus on the other things over there. So I can become conscious of the information coming into my brain. I get to curate it now rather than, you know, kind of being this zoo human that's having all these people, this thing, this stuff thrown at me um, where I have absolutely no conscious control over my environment or, or what people are putting into my mind. Right. Right. Um, Yeah. I think that's, that's such an important point and not something that we, we think about all too often. Like I think it's easy to be unaware of all this kind of mental dirt, mental clutter that's accumulating throughout the day. um, If you're not making an effort to make it conscious. Um, And, and so um, that is so key. There's another area of meditation that you alluded to in a, in a, that I've heard you talk about. um, And that is virtue. Um, Virtue as being important for, for training the mind and in every traditional um, meditation system or meditation tradition, uh, they talk about virtue as one of the pillars. Um, in, in Buddhism, it's concentration, insight, and virtue. And historically, I always thought virtue was just this, you know, it, it almost required a belief in an afterlife or something you know, that these things would come around um, and, and doing good, you know, might either get you into the, the kingdom of heaven or it might benefit you in some afterlife, reincarnation, whatever. I thought it required that belief. But I came to the realization more recently that this is so key for training the mind for you to be in a better mental state today, right now. You can tell when you haven't been following your virtu- your value system. So could you talk a little about how you think about values and how they affect the mind? Yeah, I think having, as you alluded to there, clarity on uh, what you value is, is key um, because, you know, 
one, to choose the people you surround yourself with is very important to make sure your value systems are in some way aligned, or at least you're kind of aware of your value system and others. And for me, it, it makes conscious decisions and unconscious decisions much more clear. Um, if I know what I value, I know what my hierarchy is throughout the day. And if I have to choose between seven different things on my to-do list, it's very easy for me to go, oh, well, this one's at the top. Because, you know, I work with a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, fitness, fitness athletes, and people who just have a lot on their plate. And people say, man, how do I know what to prioritize? Like, I have so many things I need to do. Well, there's your answer, right? So there's, there's many levels to it. But, you know, you need to know your big picture goal. So your 25-year goal. You need to know your three-month goal. And you need to know your values. And within that, you'll find, uh, and your values can shift, right? Your values can shift all the time. You know, you have your core values that probably won't shift. But at certain times in my life, maybe my fitness is my highest priority. It's most times in my life now, my family's my priority. And, um, you know, it just allows you to really easily and consciously make the, uh, the best decision in that moment as to what you should be focusing on, where you should be putting that single point of focus um, I think that's, you know, it's the key, man. I think people live this ambiguous life because of this fear of missing out on so many things. But if I know what I value and I know what's important to me and I have this hierarchy set out, nothing else matters, right? And if, if, if for some reason, maybe something feels like it's missing in my life, well, then reassess your values and go, oh, maybe I'm a little bit off on that one. Maybe there's something missing there that I value that I don't even realize that I value. Uh, and then eventually you'll find it and you put it on your list of, high, of, of values and you can live according to this value system. And then you're living in congruency with who you are at your essence, hopefully, and uh, you know, actually living your truth. And that's, I think, a beautiful reality, at least this far in my life, right? I'm sure there's a lot of stuff that I don't know. Um, and I just, uh, like a good student, I will always be learning. Yeah, well, I mean, so Socrates uh, was called the wisest man because he said, I... I know some, um, I know that I, there's so much I don't know. So I think that's a, also just an important statement that often, you know, folks don't admit. Um, but you know, everything you just said requires a sense of introspection to then create a value system of value hierarchy to live by because, um, you know, as you were just talking about, you can't, it's impossible to make a decision in any moment, um, decide between any sort of options unless you're deciding from some kind of value. And it might be a value that you're unconscious of unless you start to create that hierarchy. And, and one of my favorite books is called essentialism by Greg McCown. And the subtitle is the disciplined pursuit of less. And mm -hmm. he's, he says, if, if what you're, if the task you're about to take on is not a 90 plus item on it in terms of how excited you are to do it, he's not, he's not saying sometimes, sometimes we have to do things we don't want to do, but he's sure. saying in general, you know, to take on a new project or to take, you know, something on in life to want to hang out with someone it should be 90 plus. You should, you should prioritize that. You, know, you should make room for the things that are, are really um, aligned with yeah. who you are. If it's not a hell yes, it's a hell no. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's see, I, I have a lot of questions for you and sure. I want to make sure we, we get the important, important ones in, in the time we have together. Um, Okay, so you, you've you've talked a little you've talked a little bit about um, your views on. Uh, I've heard you talk about social media and and how this is affecting our minds. And um, maybe we could also talk about subliminal, or, or I guess what you've called covert influence. Um, how how these things are affecting our perceptions of reality. Sure. Um, well, Cal Newport's book, Digital Minimalism, would be a good place to start for people. Um, Everything we do is curated, right? People think we're free. We have free minds. We don't. It's all curated from the clothes we wear to the thoughts we think. You know, someone's influencing it, whether it be social media or, you know, in the past it's been television and newspaper. It's, it's all curated. So being aware of that is step one in changing it. And uh, there, there's a lot of levels of curation, you know, starting at the highest level and, and then working its way down to people just who run businesses who are trying to capture your attention, right? It's an attention economy and everyone's literally trying to pay for your seven seconds of attention. So, um, you know, learning to be aware of that and learning to um, curate what you see, you know, it's very, very easy for a human being to become addicted to social media. And, uh, you know, even the most highly aware people, myself, get into moments of like mindless activity, mindless scrolling and mindless attention, which it shouldn't be. 
I think um, learning how to control what comes in and then even be conscious enough to uh, be aware of what the, what that manipulation is, right? Because no matter what's coming into your brain, it's impacting your worldview in some way. So it's impacting it, uh, you know, whether for the better or for the worse, it's, it's completely subjective, but uh, it's certainly impacting it. So making that conscious decision of like, hey, this just came into my brain. I see this thing on my, on my worldview now. How is it impacting me? I think is a, is a powerful place to come at the world rather than letting somebody manipulate your thoughts, manipulate your beliefs, manipulate the way you look at the world, start to question everything that you think is reality, right? Question your, your uh, rules, your beliefs, um, and realize that's all bullshit, man. It's all things you've made up to get you this far in your life that uh, is, may not be true in most cases. Um, so that's really maybe why I tend to be uh, open-minded to a, a lot of things is everything that I think that I know question I'm like well, you know you know I don't think I know anything to be honest I think I just want to learn and I want to explore and I want to begin to understand more but um, you know so um, keeping my mind aware of what goes in and then the filters that I have on it and uh, you know, just keeping my mind open to always growing right right and it's for this reason actually that I've kind of stopped listening to the radio in my car because even the song lyrics are actually giving us perceptions yeah. about values and whatnot. You know, if you're listening, yep. if you listen to, the, to, to rap lyrics, it's pretty impossible not to become, um, to start thinking materialism, this materialistic worldview is going to bring you happiness. That's what they're all implying basically. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're literally uh, numbing your brain. So they're putting you into these stress states. Oftentimes when you're driving, you're in a stress state or the something on the radio is making you stressed out. And then they're making your subconscious mind more suggestible, right? It's, it's basically hypnotism at its finest level, um, right? So that's what the TV is, right? They put you in this feared state. So there's somebody out there curating the fear response and then plugging your, your subconscious mind with something you need to buy. And that's literally what's driving the economy. We know that. We should know that. Uh, but don't let yourself become the human. This is a human, right? You, you shouldn't allow yourself to be manipulated. We are. We all are at some level. We're all manipulated even by our children. Like, you know, the, the expectations that our children place upon us. If we don't take our kids to Disneyland, we're very bad parents. You know, so many things like that. There, there's just, um, I mean, we're all, we're all just being uh, manipulated at all, point, at all points in life. Right. And, you know, like, cause there are some spooky conspiracy theories out there about like who's behind the manipulation. The bottom line is it's, it's an economic machine, right? So, and so yeah. it's the manipulation is happening, not cause anyone wants to, you know, keep us brainwashed, but because it, it sells. And you mentioned the attention economy where we're operating in this world in which, you know, capturing someone's attention uh, gives a future potential reward and, and so the people who are building and a lot of them have come out now and been open about it the same people who have who programmed social media initially were looking at las vegas slot machines and using that same software um and that those same systems of intermittent reward to keep you coming back to capture more of your attention so they could yeah. monetize it so be, i think as we wake up and get off of autopilot which i think meditation is so important for we'll start to realize all the subtle ways that we're being manipulated but we don't want it to stop right we, we, we don't want it to stop because the economy will stop like you say it's all it's all driving materialism and you don't want the economy to stop because you want to have a job and you want to have a house and you don't want chaos you want the economy to keep going you don't want it to crash but you want to remove yourself right you want to be conscious enough to go okay i see what's happening over there i see the matrix right but i'm going to go ahead and step over here and um you know, meet myself and hopefully my family and my small group of curated friends that are very close can can stand back and hopefully be in as little as possible, right? In in the matrix enough to uh, make our living and um, you know, teach and learn and do whatever brings us joy and bliss, and uh, you know, hopefully not be a part of the manipulation or as little as possible. Yeah, and and I would just I would I would say there that. You know the the system doesn't need to continue the way that it has continued necessarily sure. for the it economy can to exist. Sure. So in an ideal world, good business I think is is that instead of manipulating, trying to get get a buck out of you and promising something that won't actually bring you fulfillment, 
business is aligned because it's trying to get you to act on something that it knows is good for you. So I'll, I'll give you a selfish example. I, I came out with a meditation app recently. Um, and so I'm in the attention economy. I'm trying to get people to download my app too. You know, I'm trying to capture listeners attention right now, Right. but I think it's going to benefit you. I actually think it's, if you get on my app, it's going to, it's going to improve your quality of life. So I'm, and that's actually a hard thing to do is because I'm not just asking someone to download my app. I'm asking for like 10 minutes of your time every day. Sure. For you to do nothing. And, and most people are more um, leaning toward pain aversion rather than um, pleasure accumulation, right? So you're trying to give them pleasure. Most people don't want pleasure. They just want to avoid pain. So <laughs> learning to figure out how that works in somebody's mind is the challenge. But man, I'll even, I mean, going one step deeper on that is at what point do, does helping people become a problem, right? If you help too many people, when does that fall apart, right? Because if everyone in the world is becoming healthy and conscious and waking up, well, at what point does everyone become aware of that this Ferris wheel or this, this hamster wheel is, is spinning and uh, then the economy starts to crack? I, I don't know. Like I haven't thought that many steps ahead yet, but uh, there certainly has to be a point where the whole thing has to either break or shift. And uh, listen, there's people out there that are much smarter than me that uh, hopefully have plans uh, as to what's going to happen. Because at some point there's going to be a critical mass of people either becoming aware of it or we're all going to die. <laughs> right who knows yeah certainly um and um you know but oh, i'll just say one more thing before we kind of wrap up on that point because I've, I've thought a lot about this and i think I'd, i'm i'm in the optimistic camp where sure. you know i think we have all the technology to have a self-sustaining beautiful world um and this is very idealistic but i think you know if everyone wakes up um yeah it's going to, things would get worse before they got better. you right. There, there's going to be some kind of a meltdown if, if that's what happens, especially if it happens quickly. Um, if people wake up to how they're being manipulated, but um, if everyone's, if everyone's working toward, has an idea of, of virtue at, as a basis of their work, um, I think there's enough. Do you um, think they do? No, I'm saying if they did, if, if people were conscious enough to have virtue behind the actions that behind whatever they're creating, Right. And there, there's still enough work to go around because, um, man, but do you think so there's people out there who don't have positive intentions behind their motivations or their intentions? Absolutely. And, and right. I, I think it's every individual's job, to, as you said, to unplug themselves from the matrix because the more people that do that, then suddenly the people trying to manipulate them are, you know, they have to find a more, a more aligned or more virtuous, uh, mode of living. And I know that's Maybe, not going to happen or, ju overnight. or just a different level of manipulation. Right? <laughs> Who, knows? Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. I guess, I guess we'll, we'll find out in the decades yeah. to come, but um, yeah. listen, fascinating conversation. I guess before we end is where can listeners reach you and learn more about you? Um, muscle intelligence podcast is a great place for people to come and hear me talk about this stuff. And uh, muscleintelligence.com is my newly launched site, which is very new and raw, but it'll grow as we go. Um, Instagram's a good place to find me Twitter's a good place to find me and uh, that's probably about it for now awesome well thanks so much for your time Ben it's been a real pleasure speaking with you thanks Liam likewise man I appreciate it keep doing what you're doing and it's always great to talk to someone who's geeking out about this stuff like I am <laughs>